I told you we have this antenna trainer kit. And this is what it looks like. The box with lots of antennas. And it's best if you have antenna measurement facilities. Okay? Antenna chamber, some microwave source. But if you don't, the company also makes some rudimentary facilities for measurement. So as you can see, there are many antennas. And you may not be familiar with all of these. These are not standard antennas. So let me give you a quick overview of the various kinds of antennas. And when we talk about antennas, these are basically the things we are looking at. Okay. An antenna, okay. is it a good antenna or a bad antenna? Okay. How do we make that judgment? There are three points. As I told you, input matching, which is related to the bandwidth. It is not that you always want a bandwidth to be as high as possible. No. You sometimes want broadband antennas. Sometimes you are happy with narrowband antennas. Sometimes you want narrowband antennas. There's a lot of garbage in different frequencies. You are interested in a very specific frequency. So you want narrowband antenna. Bandwidth is usually defined in terms of the input matching. If the antenna input impedance is 5000 J, Imaginary 5000 ohms. It's not of much use. It's not matched to any normal source or load. Okay. Sources and loads are typically 50 ohms in microwave frequencies. So 50 plus J0 is typically the input impedance from the antenna. If it is near about that, it's a good antenna. If it is near about that for your entire frequency, it's a good antenna. If it is near about that for your desired frequency, it's a good antenna. One of the criteria, not all of these. There is also radiation pattern. Okay? You may wish your antenna to be omnidirectional. It should radiate all over the place. Or you may wish your antenna to be narrow beam. Not narrow band, narrow beam. Okay? So you wish the radiation to be concentrated in a particular direction. It's up to the requirement. Okay? In that, there are you may have heard terms like E-plane, H-plane, co-polarized, cross-polarized. So, radiation pattern uh, have many finer points. Okay? It's not just enough to say that the power is all being directed into this direction or it's all being distributed uniformly. You have to be a little more careful. You have to look at it more closely. So, let's not go into those things too much. Finally, you have a very closely aligned parameter from this gain. But usually when you distinguish between radiation pattern and gain, what you're saying is that this gain incorporates the loss in the antenna. Okay? An antenna may take one watt of power okay, and distribute it uniformly. All of that one watt. Another antenna may take one watt of power and distribute uniformly half watt. Obviously, the first antenna is a good antenna. Both of them may have the roughly the same kind of radiation pattern. All the power is being directed uniformly. But they are not the same. Gain refers to that. Okay. Or another word is efficiency. Gain and efficiency are closely related. Finally, these are the basic parameters. There are finer points like is this antenna a fixed beam antenna or is there a way by computer control I can switch the beam this way, that way. That fixed frequency, it's narrowband antenna, that fixed frequency, is it really fixed or from the computer I can shift it here, there as per my requirements. You saw an example there, very configurable. So in terms of these, Let's quickly go through the pictures are not that good, but I think you can see. This is the most familiar so-called microstrip patch antenna. Microstrip patch antenna has many variations. This is the simplest one, the rectangular patch. Note that all of these have a coaxial feed. Okay? The feed is very important at microwave frequencies. It's more difficult to design this part of the whole antenna than that part. 
but nobody usually talks about this. All theory is about this stuff. This one is almost the same. There's a minor difference in the way the field is connected. The third one is a circular patch antenna. All of these are microstrip patch antennas. What are their properties? Number one, in terms of bandwidth and input mass. Typically, these are 3 to 4 percent bandwidth. <coughs> Which means at 1 gigahertz, the bandwidth will be 30 megahertz. Okay? So 40 megahertz. Right? That's the typical bandwidth over which the input is well matched to 50 hertz. The radiation pattern, fairly broad beam, but in this direction. Very little back radiation. Because there is a solid metal backing. Okay? So the back radiation is very small. Notice I say very small, not zero. A little <coughs> bit of radiation does leak out from the sides. Have you heard of the term diffraction? Diffraction, like light when it hits a sharp corner, it paints this with that way. Same thing with the corner. There's a little bit of diffraction, and there is some radiation backwards, but not much. Polarization, linearly polarized. For those who don't know much about polarization, don't worry about it. They can't explain, but anyway, this is called linear polarized. So these are. Now these are different types. This is the so called CPW patch. Okay. CPW is another type of transmission line, a little different from a microstrip. Remember, I described the microstrip. So I have the ground and I have a strip. It's a two conductor transmission line, right? CPW is a little different in the sense. CPW stands for coplanar waveguide. Okay? Coplanar waveguide. Coplanar because the ground plane is now shifted to the top. Okay? But it can't be all shifted to the top then because it will merge with this. So what is done is no ground plane on the bottom. Back side is free. No matter. You have ground plane like this. But two ground planes. Two ground planes. Okay. How do you make sure both are ground? Ground means both have to be at zero potential. How do you make sure of that? That is done by the circuit. Okay. For example, how is it done here? If you look at it very carefully, you can see two pins sticking to those two ground. Can you see them? Is it visible on the picture? Mm -hmm. Those pins are actually connected to this housing. Solidly connected to this one. So both are connected. So these are connected. Okay. In more complicated circuits, it's just a simple antenna. If it's, if it's a more complicated circuit, sometimes people actually take bridging wires to keep the potential equal on the two ground. So that's called a CPW. So this is a CPW patch, very similar to this, but then the ground plane is on top. What is the benefit of this CPW? Two benefits. First of all, see this is also narrow band antenna, a little more bandwidth actually, but not much more, maybe seven eight percent. But it's closer to an okay? because now there is that side radiation also. So this time the radiation is both sides. Only direction where there is no radiation or very little radiation is towards the sides. Okay? And even towards the sides, you do have a little bit of radiation. So this is very close to an omni. Okay? That's the CPW antenna. There is another advantage of this CPW line. Okay? If you are using a transistor and let's say some circuit okay? and you to need to make a ground connection. For example, the emitter of a BJT has to be grounded. It's a common emitter circuit. In a microstrip, you have to drill a hole to ground. Here you don't have to drill a hole. It's all on the same side. 
Okay, that's a big advantage. If your substrate is made of a brittle material, something like alumina or quartz or silicon, the drilling a hole is not as hard. Yeah, boy. That's why we and use these uh, CPU. But nothing great about it. It's still a two-wire transmission. One wire for the current to go, and one wire split into for the current. This is like it is a circularly polarized antenna. Once again, I am not sure if everybody is very familiar with this circular polarization business. I am not going into the details. The only thing is that LC has two inputs. Okay, this is different, very different from the two port pairs earlier. This is not that. Okay, this is meant to be used either this. Only one will be used at a time. So suppose you are using one, terminate that with your own load. And you get LCP, left circularly polarization. What happens if you use the other one and terminate this one? You will get R. Okay. This is circularly polarized, either polarization. At your will, you select. If you feed from one port, you get one type. If you from the other side, you get another. How and why? You know, that is standard theory. Well known. Here. The last one, this one, sixth one. That is a reconfigurable antenna again. It is not very clearly visible, but uh, maybe you can see. This is the same as the first one, patch antenna, okay? No difference. But there is another. Secondary patch there is small patch. And if I could connect this patch to the other one, then obviously the size goes up. The resonant frequency will go down. So how do I connect? There's a diode there. If I turn on the diode, how do I turn on that? There's a bias connection here. Allow it currently to flow through this diode, which is ground point, to be connected. The effective size will go up and frequency will go down. If I negative bias the diode, reverse bias the diode, the diode is like off. It's open circuit. So this small one plays no role. Now it works very high. You see these thin lines there. <coughs> Barely visible, one is somewhat visible, one is almost not visible. There are very thin copper packs which act like inductors actually. And they don't allow the RF signal to go into them. But the biasing signal can go through them freely from this to the ground. The RF signal is only the patch and has. This is a reconfigurable. The company, you know, this is the difference between academic work and company's work. Okay. The company has to market, so the market is the battery also. So that you don't need anything more, everything is provided for. These are a separate category of antennas. Let's start with the last one. You can see the top and bottom. This is a slot antenna and uh, this is a little complicated. It's a broadband slot antenna. Normal slot antennas are thin slots. Okay. Thin slot. This is a very interesting thing in electromagnetic theory. You probably won't encounter it much in your undergraduate curriculum. But there is a very uh, strong correlation mathematically between a current carrying wire okay, and lots of current flowing but no current flowing in a slot. Okay. Mathematically, the, the, this, these properties can be used to understand those properties. So, but again, that's, I will not go too much into the theory. 
<coughs> Suffice to understand that this is the input, this is the microscopic line, and there is some funny structure here which couples the energy into this slot. Then it radiates out of the slot. Radiation is bi direction, both on top and below. There is no metal shield to prevent radiation. Okay? And normal slots are thin, this one is a very thick slot. A thick slot people have found. Again, how did they find? It's just empirical. They were doing something and they found that this thick slot has a very broad band radiation. So that's a broad band slot antenna. Now these are spiral antennas. What are spiral antennas? Spiral antennas are very broad band antennas, typically like you know, 1 to 18 gigahertz, that kind of band. Really broadband antennas. But that's not all. There are other broadband antennas also. We have shown you some. Spiral antennas have another property which no other antenna has. They are broadband and throughout that broadband the radiation is circularly polarized. One second or one part is clockwise, the other part is no 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 no. A given circular a given spiral antenna will produce LCP or RCP, not both. If you want the same antenna to produce the other one, then you have to use its mirror image. So that is the important property. Once again, for those of you who are not very familiar with the circularly polarized business, doesn't matter much. Just think of it as a product antenna. Really broad band. In theory, there is no limit to how broad it can be. The practical limits are limited by size and other things. This is spiral antenna. You can see the spiraling tracks. This is a printed spiral. It's printed on a PC kind of thing. This is a back side, which is nothing new. So that's a printed spiral antenna. And I told you, remember I told you. Current carrying conductor and a non current carrying gap in a sheet have very similar properties. That is used here. This is called a slot spiral antenna. The slot spiral antenna is useful because we can use these non slot regions okay, for feeding the slot spiral antenna. To feed an antenna, to feed a spiral antenna, sorry, you have to get to its center. How do you get to the center? How do you get to the center here? See? Either you use a non printed structure, you bring a coaxial cable here, some kind of 3D structure. It's actually the best way. See? It works best that way. You bring a thin coaxial cable somewhere, a jumper coaxial cable to this. It can be done. But we wanted to make it fully planar. Planar means PCB type of And with one coaxial connection. So we have to do all kinds of funny things here and bring a very thin pair of wires to the center. Here it is much easier. Because you see here this ground plane. So on top of the ground plane on the other side, we can afford to print this structure. The microscope. That winds its way down to the so that's the advantage of a slot spiral. Otherwise, it's not a very big deal. All this is in theory. Okay, when we actually made it, it doesn't work very well, actually. Real spiral antennas, those which you can buy, are not like this. They are not fully printed. There are other things there. But anyway, this was for just a demonstration kit for colleges. So we didn't bother too much to make it a very fine antenna. It's just enough to demonstrate its properties. So two kinds of spiral antennas. This, this is a printed dipole antenna. The first antenna that one teaches, dipole antenna. What is the dipole antenna? This. Just two wires. And uh, you may have heard of the term half wavelength. Why half wavelength? Because that's the lowest frequency at which this works nicely. Length will be half wavelength. 
This is the printed version of that. This is one half, that is one half. But it is printed on two sides of the substrate. One half of the dipole is on one top side of the substrate, the other half is on the bottom side. The field is microstrip. Look at this, back side strip. Gradually the back side is tapered to this point and close that way. The top side is not tapered, it just carries on and close. This is the printed dipole. What is its radiation pattern? Fairly, you remember the have you seen the radiation pattern of a dipole? Figure of eight. Figure of eight actually means it radiates uniformly in this way, but in this plane there are nulls on top and bottom. Okay? So it's a similar kind of thing. It radiates uniformly if you look at around the dipole. Not very uniform because there is this interface here. But somewhat uniform. And in these two directions there is close to a nulls. Okay, so in this plane, the radiation is not so uniform as we define. Then there is a version of this dipole with parasitic reflectors and directors called the Yagi antenna. Have you heard of the Yagi antenna? Yes, sir. Yes, we have other elements here and there. Okay. That's a great idea. <coughs> One element, the main element here and here. If you want to visualize, you have to remember that these two have to be turned like this. Top and bottom, fold them like this. So then, these and this and this will go in opposite directions, become the dipole. You have a director there, you have a big reflector there. This has very little radiation in the back direction. Due to these two, it's more concentrated in the front direction. So that's a printed Yagi antenna. This one is so called electromagnetically coupled patch antenna. You have seen an earlier patch antenna, right? The microstrip was directly connected to the patch. Here it is not. Here it's a double layer substrate. So you have one microstrip. Okay. And we have another substrate. The patch is on the bottom side of this substrate. It's hard to draw. Okay. So that is the top substrate. On its top you can see a microstrip. This is the bottom substrate. On its bottom you can see the patch in between these two. Below this substrate, there is a ground plane. Here there is a ground plane. How does energy go from here to the slot then, to the patch then? There is a little cut in the ground here, there is C, okay. through which the energy is coupled. Not of great importance, it is of some importance where you have multiple patch antennas okay, and they are DC isolated. Okay. There is no DC path from the feed line to the patch. So if you have multiple patch antennas with some circuitry and you don't want them to interfere, so here it is easier. But it, as I said, it's not a very big advantage. This has some application, so it's included it. Okay? It's called an electromagnetically coupled patch, as in not directly connected to the field. Finding some arrays. To by to array of patch antennas. Notice the patches are all fed in the same direction. Common mistake people make is the plan coming, separated into two, separated into two more, and then you connect the patches here. This will unfortunately not do because the radiation from this will be this directed. By symmetry, the radiation from the opposite direction, and in this direction, they will cancel. This is not what you want. Take out the This is one way of feeding. First, you make the feed structure, 
and at the ends of the feed structure you connect your antenna. Another way of feeding is that series spread. The input to the first patch is not all radiated out. You see, we can do that. You will see another case. Not all radiated out. So we go to the next one. Still not all radiated out. So we go on to the third one. Finally, it is all radiated. Three element array, two by two element array. And the last example is the so-called leaky wave antenna. Similar type of thing, but many more elements. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements. Eight elements. What are these elements? These are slots in the ground plane of a microstrip. So this is a microstrip. On the back is the ground plane, but the ground plane is not just a ground plane. There are slots cut in the ground. And they radiate out the power gradually. So people, you can think of it as while the signal is traveling on the microstrip line, the power is being leaked out. We don't leak out too much in the beginning. Okay? We leak out more here because the power is weaker here. So we have to leak out a little more of it so that the leaking roughly remains constant throughout its length. The last one element leaks out everything okay so the power input is leaked out over a long line uniform it's not that lot of power is leaking out here only a little is leaking out there no power level in the line is going down but the leakage is also increasing so overall it's a uniform leaking out of the power what is the advantage what is that we get from these four elements as opposed to the other one, as opposed to this one element? It's that <coughs> radiation is coming from a larger area. That's the whole point of arrays. Radiation comes out of a small area, the beam is going to be broad. Radiation comes out of a large area, the beam can be made narrow. That's what all arrays do. Well, that's what all that is start from at least. That's the idea. And that's how we do it in these three cases. That's, I think, all that there was in this case. Okay? So that covers a fairly broad spectrum of antenna types. Of course, not all. There are hundreds of antenna types. So, but this is a pretty good choice displaying the basic properties. I hope you have seen how they are different. Some of them are unidirectional, some of them are bidirectional, some narrow beam, some broad beam, some broad band, some narrow band. Okay. How about efficiency or gain? They are all roughly the same. These are all printed antennas which are roughly efficiency of the order of 50%. Some of them are more, some of them are less. But all of them are the same. None of these antennas are very efficient. What are the very efficient antennas? The reflector antennas, dish antennas, wave guide point, those are very efficient antennas. What are the very low efficiency antennas? Well, obviously you would not like to use such an antenna, but by and large among the common antennas, the microstrip patch antenna, especially the reconfigurable version, is fairly uh, low efficiency. Because we have diodes and other messy things, so there is loss there. Why do you use why do you use them in that case if they are inefficient? Well, you have other features. You have to sacrifice something to get something. Okay? So you sometimes you may sacrifice on the efficiency to get some special feature. Okay, so that is a description of something we Made. There's a company called Scientific Instruments Company somewhere in Ghaziabad who makes this stuff. If you want to get a kit, write to them or you can always write to me. I will direct any inquiries to them. Okay. So, one little presentation on how do you work out the properties of an antenna in receiving mode. Okay. Textbooks will give you all about radiation pattern of all that. Okay. But if you say that I have this antenna, 
well known standard of you know, and I have a signal incident on it. Okay? So many watts per square meter power density incident. How many watts will I get out at the power? I don't think you will find that in any of the e common textbooks. Of course, all it is all there, but I thought uh, maybe most of you will be unfamiliar with this part. It is an important problem. You know. What is the signal that I get? Suppose one wave coming from here, another wave coming from here. What is the signal that I get at the output of the antenna? So, how do I analyze that? That is another final, you know, more standard class book type. Suppose I have this dipole antenna. For this antenna, properties are very well known in the sense that if I am told what is this current I naught, okay, then I can write this in closed form. The electric field and obviously magnetic field also, at least in the far field, okay, exactly as a function of r theta phi. This is known. So, if I am told this is in so many milliamps, and if I am asked at 35 meters distance, what is the electric field in volts per meter? I can calculate it, no problem. Reverse problem in receiving mode. Suppose I am told that this is terminated in some resistor or not, and I have plane wave incident on this antenna. Okay? A plane wave, you know what is a plane wave? A uniform plane wave. Some characteristics are there, electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other. They are both perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Okay? E by H is equal to characteristic impedance 377 ohms. All these properties are there. So, I suppose I am told. I am even given the electric field. The electric field of a plane wave is easy to write down. The expression, complete expression is given. What is the power dissipated in this resistor? So, how many milliwatts are being dissipated? Or even better, I would like to know what is the voltage which is developed across this resistor. So this is a difference. Voltage is a complex quantity, it has phase also, okay? depending on the phase of this. Power is scalar, so voltage carries more information actually. How do I answer this question? So that is not easy to say. Okay? Uh, you will not find this information is in any of the standard textbooks. Of course it is there in the literature. So let us see. Exactly. The reciprocity theorem is what is used. Okay, so this is well known. We know all about this, right? You also know very important part is that for any atom in the far field, okay, the electric field is of this type. Do you know that? Okay? The radius depend the R dependence and the theta and phi dependence, they are separate. And the R dependence is very well known. It's always this. The theta phi dependence is a different story. That is different for different antennas. Point uh, narrow beam antennas, broad beam antennas. That's theta phi dependence, angular dependence. Radial dependence is always inverse square law. So the field decay as per R, power goes as per R squared. Okay, and that e to the power minus j k not R. It's obviously delay, phase shift. This expression is very important because in the subsequent lot of mathematics are there, I will not go into the detail. But this is this form which is the important. So K naught R here. You know, if you put 4 pi K naught R or 4 pi R, there will be small differences in the form expression. So this is the expression which I am using. 
You see that K naught is not important. Okay. Now, after we start from this, there is a lot of very complicated mathematics. Let us assume that this antenna is being fed with some transmission line, let's say wave guide. And inside this transmission line, due to this excitation, I have a field, a wave going this way, maybe a wave going back also. The antenna need not be ideally matched. Then a wave going this way and another wave going back. Okay? Mathematically, how do I write that? This is how I write it. Electric field inside the transmission line is equal to A, some A constant, times some function. For example, the cross sectional electric field has some functional form. In a waveguide, it is sine, pi x by A, whatever mode, and all those things. But main point is this small A strength. So many volts per meter. This is the important number. It will be there in the final results. This A is the strength of the field in the transmitted mode. I have not even come to the receiving mode yet. And this A prime is something else, which is due to the mismatch of the angle. For example, how do I get that here? I will say that, okay. Let this be connected through a transmission line of characteristic impedance R0. The same R0 here. And some Vs, some source voltage, which is let's say 1 volt. 1 volt doesn't mean 1 volt DC. Okay? This is all at a particular frequency. Frequency is implied that K0 K naught contains frequency omega. Okay. If this is the case, I can analyze this circuit. How do I analyze it? I know the input impedance of the antenna. So as a circuit, I have source, resistor, transmission line, and load impedance. I can analyze this by the standard techniques. Thevenin. So not Thevenin, it's not usual uh, transmission line circuit analysis. Okay. And I can calculate A strengths this way and then this one I really don't need, this one I need. Number one, I can calculate these two because see this transmission line is modulus as ZL. ZL is the input impedance of the antenna. We know there are standard graphs for the input impedance of a dipole. Okay, so at that particular frequency, we will read from the graphs what is that and put it there. But this analysis will also tell me what is current. I know that I know there. In all in transmitting mode till now, I have not yet come to the receiving mode. Okay. Once I have this I naught, the feed current to the dipole, then this is done and I will be able to write the complete expression for the radiated transmitted fields. Okay. So, what I have got till now is this complete expression. Okay. This complete expression and that number. This is done. Okay? I have chosen this one volt, whatever volt it is chosen, it is not important. Okay. So this is all done. Right? Okay. Now, let's bring in the receiving mode. We have not yet discussed the receiving mode. Okay? So, no. And as I told you, the mathematics is quite tedious, so we will not bother too much about it.
this is a PDF file. <laughs> I'm not able to do that in slideshow. Okay. Uh, I think you can see. You can read this. Okay. In receiving mode, this is the expression for the. The incident electric field is equal to direction of the field E i. Okay? Remember this direction, it has to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Okay? Time this expression. This is the standard expression for the electric field of a uniform plane. What is the direction of propagation? Some arbitrary vector u i. U i is defined as the direction of propagation. Or rather, no. Minus it's coming from the direction u i. So your dipole is here. Let's choose our coordinates somewhere. This x, y, z. Okay, and y. See, I have taken care of the transmitted mode. I have some expressions. Those are very useful. The real problem is now. Suppose this is the dipole, and this is where. This is the way the plane wave is propagating. Ui is defined as a unit vector in that direction. Okay? Direction from which this plane wave is coming. So the direction of propagation and of course transmitting mode for the field is a function of theta and phi. Which theta and phi we take? Direction u i. E i given again the receiving the incident field. So everything is known. What is not known? B is not known, which we calculate provided we know this available power. Okay? What is this available power? Once again, that there is an expression for that available power. A squared by 2zc, the characteristic impedance of this line, which is R0 in this case, cross sectional integration of the electric in that guide. Next. This is a waveguide electric field which has to be integrated. This is one calculation which is, can be done at the beginning of the problem. Okay. And so that expression is also known from there. This is how one calculates. Ultimately, what did we get out of is all these complicated things. The derivation is fine, that's one thing. But more importantly, out of the final result, this result, what did we get? This number B. What is B? B is the signal which goes to that load. Now that there is no, res no source here, it's a receiving antenna under the influence of this field, okay? this B is that source, that A. To do it, we require A, we require transmitting mode electric field. These two numbers we calculated first, you see, for that one volt source. Whether it is one volt or two volt will not matter. This is there, they will cancel out here. Pi is the receiving field. Okay? This is how one does it. And you can do this, this because you have a complex field. If you have multiple incident fields, you can use superposition and calculate all the different signals that total signal will be available. Okay? The only there is not much more that I can say about this. This is the way it is done. Okay? If you really want to go into it, you're welcome to study the derivation. One of the few things that you can figure out here is that. If the transmitting field is linearly polarized, okay, and the incident signal is cross-polarized like this, then it will not receive any power. Transmitting field is LCP, receiving field is RCP, it will not receive any power. Okay. That is called a total polarization mismatch. On the other hand, if the transmitted field is Linearly polarized, the receiving field is circularly polarized. It will receive some power. Okay? There is some polarization mismatch, but some power will be caught by the end. So 
that last turn there gives something called polarization mismatch. Okay.